going to sell you today is one big message about reliability and resilience and redundancy because a lot of the companies that we visit and see have thinned themselves so thin and entered into things like industry 4.0 that they've forgotten about the reliability that's needed to ensure product flow. So particularly in my world, which currently is healthcare, our systems are broken, they're being sped up, we have very little buffer stock or buffers of any description, and so things go wrong an awful lot quicker, and things stop a lot quicker. The whole system stop quicker. If you actually look at uh, the point of detection of mid-staffs onwards to the point at which uh, mid-staffs collapsed, you find systematic failures everywhere. So what I'm trying to sell you is an idea of reliability, reaction speed, resilience, repeatability, and redundancy. Redundancy in my world is not business process re-engineering, which is what it was in the 1990s. That was getting rid of middle managers, which was the greatest American faux pas ever, because he got rid of all the middle managers who knew the best practice in the world and knew what needed to be changed. So he hollowed them out, got rid of them, and lost a lot of organizational knowledge. Agreed or disagree? They left. The senior executives knew where businesses should go. The middle managers were the driving force. The middle managers would fight each other, and the shop floor would get on with building things, wondering why on earth people were fighting each other. But the more we move into Buffalo systems, the more we need reliability. Uh, Simon was very, very kind. I was actually the bag carrier for Dan and Dave and Donna and Simon and John. Uh, it is. I was the person who sat there and listened patiently to Dan saying, I've just been done doing 90 odd miles an hour down the A449 by South Wales Police. Did you, Dan? Yeah. I got off of it. Why? I said I was calibrating my speedo. It has never worked for me. <laughs> Come here, Sonny. <laughs> and we had other weird people come visit us, like a gentleman who decided to come to see us from figleaves.com who said he'd set up a business in bras and knickers and he was going to sell small size and large size and could we lean and help him? So throughout the whole of our life at Lean, we've had nothing but unusual requests and unusual people come to see us to look at designing systems. The interesting thing now is most of the people we deal with are not the people with the original thinking. So 25 years on, your 16-year-olds, when we were first doing the lean work, are now in the middle management to senior middle management positions, and they've lost a lot of the learning of the early lean work. They never had it, to be fair. They were 16, 17 at the time. So there's a big knowledge gap for what we're doing in terms of the knowledge of designing good and robust systems. Leaning things out or going into your, dare I say it, the Six Sigma world, and some of the extremists in the Six Sigma world who can measure everything still aren't very good at improving anything when the problem is basically re resulting from the machine. So imagine in 1990 when we started doing research in this very building or the one next door, when we had casting companies and spring making companies and seat companies saying Toyota want eight deliveries a day and they don't think we should have more than two hours worth of safety stock at the end of the lines. That brings a bit of a sharpness in terms of your design of your system and how it works and how we recover from failure and how we prevent failure from happening. Does this make sense? You are not heading into a world of Industry 4.0 where you can make anything for anybody at any time with desks that move up and down and operators that are probably engineers who don't want to be operators because they want to be engineers. But they'll be making things in ones and twos and threes and ones and doing things over and over and over again. But without a knowledge of the reliability of the process and how it fits together and how it works, they're still as exposed as an average 16-year-old who's never been trained in how to use the machine other than through a TWI course. Contentious, I guess. <laughs> My background is here at university with Dan, then uh, got exiled. Uh -huh. I bought a cosmetics company that was bankrupt which isn't very good for weddings and long-term marriages because you say, I've just put the whole house into this cosmetics company. Don't worry, we can turn it around. You're involved too, because <laughs> if it goes wrong, we haven't got anywhere to live. <laughs> but thankfully, that went okay. And then we sold on. Then went to Warwick to study patient safety and understand from an engineering point of view why processes go wrong and how do you get intelligent people to work in a very messed up system. And how do you set the system up for people to fail? 
Then in 2012, I went over and was lucky enough to join the Royal Mint as the Chief Industrial Engineer for the 2012 Olympic and Paralympic medals, which probably wasn't taken up by many people in the minting world because it's a career-limiting job if you get it wrong. You know, if the medals don't turn up in the right quantity, at the right size, at the right time, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a problem, a bit of a showstopper. I then end up in, in Swansea, which usually gets a boo if you're this side of the postcode of Cardiff. <laughs> but I am bringing religion to Swansea. So that's the background. What do we do? We don't mess around with um, lots of, I think somebody referred to earlier as BS academic research. <laughs> We're actually in there up to our necks in it. So these pictures around the outside of getting things to work right uh, are all activities that we're involved with, including putting factories onto wheels, which is a bit like the Welsh Blood Service or NHBT's blood collection lorry. There's no reason why you can't put a 3D printer on there and move it around the world to where you need it. All the way through to how do we change the architecture of MRI scanners so that we can get rid of the current problem we have. Anybody from the health service will know that 10% of people don't turn up to use our MRI scanners. A further 8% are too big, physically big, to get onto the trolley, or weight big to kill the motors to get you into the machine. And then a further 3 or 4% turn up with metal in them, even though we tell them you mustn't have metal in your body. This is not like a set of magnets that will pin you to the ceiling and then pin you to the floor. This is what happens with your microwave if you put a teaspoon in it. So a lot of these processes that we're looking at are to do with how do you make business processes resilient and reliable, including, if we get lean enough, how do we put in redundant spare machinery so that we can flick it on whenever it's needed. So I was here during the, the big book, and with Anne's modification to putting pace in, and this is where I got blooded with the, the likes of Tesco's and others, and this is where I was interested, really, the research agenda that carries on today, which is the essence of lean. <coughs> Not the tools and techniques, because people have been critical of lean, and they've said, oh, you're a bunch of tool heads. No, you were given the essence of lean. What you failed to appreciate was the principles and the logic that meant the system worked properly. So, yeah, you can, you can spin it however you want, but you fundamentally miss the logic of how do you set up a lean system. And there's no surprise that Toyota calls the Toyota production system the thinking person system. In 1994... The annual accounts read how we saved 1.5 billion US dollars through suggestions from the employees, 64,000 of them at the time, to make Toyota better. Why do they want that? Because policy deployment said that the yen was depreciating, car costs were going through the roof, and they needed to sell cars abroad. Now, you fundamentally miss the essence of what is the design of a robust system. Oh, yeah, let's go and do another 5S activity. You don't know why you're doing it. Why do you do a 5S activity? To show to somebody the difference between right and wrong, normality and abnormality in the workplace. It's a control system. It's a control system that gets people to report abnormalities. It's the design of a system that means as soon as I detect something, I report it. It's the same as why we have little orange or dayglow green indicators on truck wheels for the likes of Eddie Stobart, because as soon as those indicators go out of true, we know you can't start the truck and you must tighten the nuts on the wheel. The nuts cost a few pence, the wheels cost, tires cost a thousand pound, and a rig will cost you 120,000 pounds worth of rig. It's a control system. Perfection. So this is where people misinterpreted lean and they forgot that it was all about a resilient system. If you're going to deliver eight times a day to Toyota with no more than two hours worth of finished goods stocked, you must have a seriously good asset control regime. You can have as much quality improvement in the world as you like and as much good industrial engineering as you like. But unless those machines are maintained properly, you will fail. Inevitably, a machine failure will exhaust the two hours that you've got of finished good stock. And then you don't recover. Don't just think Toyota. Food industry, there's penalty charges according to late delivery. So this is what a system looks like. The Toyota system, if you take it and move it from its essence and you put it into its tools and techniques, had three arms. One to do with quality, one to do with delivery, which is the industrial engineering, and the one to do with the total productive maintenance and the proactive maintenance that made sure that the machines worked. Average national wage in the UK, 18 to 24,000 pound, cost of the asset they, they run in an eight-hour shift, hundreds of thousands of pounds. 
an ignorant operator, an ignorant maintainer, means machine stoppage equals no finished goods stock equals customer complaints. Not too difficult to work it out. You, know, you put it into my world in terms of trying to do work in, in health service, and they don't get all of this, or they don't understand failure costs or the high penalties of not getting it right. That was taking the essence and putting it into a production system that's good at quality, delivery, and maintenance is the only one that can deliver the cost reductions other than product design, because maintenance is the only one that can take out your safety stocks. There's the tools, which you've all seen, and the, most of that battleground, by the way, in the top left, was between different tribes who have everything in common except an agreement that they have everything in common. <laughs> so, no, this is a Six Sigma tool. No, this is a lean tool. Excuse me. Most companies go bankrupt because their cash flow stops, not that they're basically unprofitable. These things, the three, the, the quality, the delivery, and the maintenance, keep your cash flow going. Agreed? And then we have interventions. So this fascinated me too, because the maintenance interventions deal with people's skills and people's know-how when it comes to machines. You'll see a bit later, those of you that don't invest in machine knowledge will eventually hit a glass ceiling whereby there is no further improvement, because operators don't know enough about the machinery they control to be able to do decent problem solving. And the UK doesn't have enough industrial engineers or engineers to be able to take them to that level of understanding. Agreed or not agreed? So we took lean, but we didn't always take the reliability side of what we're doing. Sure, you can pick up any book off of Amazon and work out how much stock you need for your Kanban, but most people in the UK did that and forgot to put in safety stock. And the safety stock was there as a buffer to protect the organization, to give it some resilience against things that would go wrong. And in the early days of lean in the car industry in the UK, we did have line stoppages for a failed product arriving and 4,000 workers stood down. <coughs> so in terms of reliability, the UK industry has learned it the hard way. There was never the building. There's good quality, good industrial engineering. Oop, let's jump and do policy deployment. Oop, the TPM side is a little bit too difficult. But the TPM is where the bulk of the people in the organization, if they're doing autonomous maintenance or operator-based maintenance, do the daily inspects that make sure that that machine is perfectly under control eight or nine times a day. It's done quicker than your can buy cards that are typically done once a day as an audit. That once a day is an eight hour exposure to a failure. Looking at the machine multiple times in an hour is a number of minutes before exposure. Agreed? If we agree on this, then it's our onus des design systems that are reliable and robust. Nothing works otherwise. Oh, sorry, I put this one in because I love to have a little tease about the Six Sigma people. You're very bright. I know you're very bright. Because you tell me you're bright and you give me stats that I don't understand. <laughs> but this is my only chance to have a punch back, so you'll forgive me, please. This top line shows the number of people who get tied up and tangled in their bed sheets, and that's correlated with the per capita cheese consumption. And there's obviously an upward trend in this, and the two are obviously related. Anybody who likes Nicolas Cage films, beware, because you're likely to drown <laughs> in a swimming pool. Thank you very much. Your data tells me nothing about anything I can use. Here's another good one. This is like the Omen 2 to the National Health Service. You say there's something called DWI, and it'll help you do things in a standard way if you follow it logically, and it's psychologically very good for you, and they deny there's any such thing as a standard. But when you say to them, how many ways can you take a kneecap out, they'll say there's three. You go in from the sides, the front, or the back. And how many times is it a way to change a valve in a heart? Oh, two. And you think, and you know nothing about standards? Let me introduce you to another character in the health service who taught you a lot that you didn't listen to. Her name is Florence Nightingale. She's not the best loved person in the world for sure. But she certainly knew about the 80-20 rule long before it became popular. So TWI is something that we are working with to understand its application for health in a way that can be used by people who are very, very professional in their background and professional in the way they do things and governed by protocols often governed by national pathways. 
So this is our research. I don't think it's quite BS research. I think it's quite good, actually. Keep me going for the next 15 years. <laughs> and my children's children. This is the health service. Anybody who's lean or Six Sigma or has a TPM background is a little ship of order on a massive sea of chaos. Our systems melt down all the time. We have near misses, lapses, bad human factors. We talk a good talk. We say it's the system fault these days. We've learned that talk. And then we blame the individual anyway. So we get rid of the surgeons who did the bad work. But our thinking is now towards thinking about systems. But what we lack are the tools to do it. And unfortunately, we don't always import the tools from the right areas. So we spend a lot of time listening to America. America is a private healthcare system. You may as well listen to South Africa, which is a very private system, which means if you're thrown out of a car with a machete wound in Johannesburg, you're still not going to be treated because you don't pay your insurance. But it's a different system. It's motivated by profit. The UK system is not necessarily motivated by profit. It's motivated by keeping our budgets intact. But the point is well made that the technology is the same the world over, patients are almost the same the world over, so shouldn't you be involved in improvement? Previous to that, Don Berwick proved that people should be involved in improvement. And he responded to a, um, a document that was produced by the Institute of Medicine called To Err is Human, and in which that document it stated that American healthcare kills about 90,000 people a year through medication errors. So shouldn't we learn some of the logic and the essence of building a decent, highly reliable organization? Should we stop and think a little bit as to what we need? Because what we need is probably not to replicate what somebody else had. It's very difficult to replicate with ease. But this is the NHS. This is a complete mess. It shouldn't make any sense to you whatsoever, but all of you will read it. According to John Dean, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letters of the word are in the right order. This is healthcare. It sort of makes sense. And do you know what we do? We teach you how to do healthcare by copying what other people have done. And they didn't understand the system either. So at this current month, we have the F1s that are in the hospitals now learning their trade. They've come out of their textbooks and now been put into systems that are fundamentally broken. And we rather hope they survive. So usually on an A&E department, you tend to see lots of people being referred for loads and loads of tests because they've read it in a textbook that they should do loads of tests, they've seen it on Holby City, and know that they need A's and E's and I's and O's and U's and M's and P's and Q's and everything else. And yet the problem probably isn't that difficult. If you go into our research, is there an 80-20 rule to the A&E department, do you reckon? <laughs> there is. It's a faller. It's intoxicated. It's got a urinary tract infection and it's generally quite irritable. It's Sunday night. And then we have the generally unwells. The generally unwells know that Monday morning is work morning. And I feel very unwell. <laughs> My mother would have seen them off with a good dose of Epsom salts. They were going back to work. It certainly take their mind off of feeling unwell. So we put them in systems that don't work. And there's a logic. Everybody will tell you start with quality. Uh-oh. We have to go back one step further, one chapter further. We have to start with safety and morale. The people need to be at work and moaning, because if they're not moaning, they've given up. If they're at work and moaning, it means they still care about the system. So therefore, safety is the most important thing to us. So we don't get ineffective handovers, because handovers kill people. It's actually rated the number one killer of, of people as they get through a hospital. And we applied the OEE measure to handovers. The OEE measure of availability of the document times the completeness of the document times its legibility and still had 30%. Handovers, not from paramedics to A&E, but internal wards and GPs. Do you think that's frightening? How about this then? There are certain parts of the UK that have 17% more patient records than they've got patients in the population, even accounting for vagrants. Hello? I don't know who you are. I just create your record. <laughs> You're not a psychopath, are you? <laughs> well, I might be. No, fundamentally unstable, wrong thing to do. Error, unreliable. So does this make sense? Safety and morale is the only thing that keeps patients flowing in a, in a hospital. If you don't have that, they stop. Then comes quality. And if safety and morale go up and quality goes up, costs come down. Then you can go into delivery and you can go into all the logic that underpins a good system. 
So you can't jump to a flexibility stage or a supply chain redesign stage or a service redesign stage very easily without creating a good bedrock of what's there. Agreed? It ain't going to work. So what do we do as a government? We'll probably prioritise delivery. The three-hour triage time is the be-all and end-all. Let's hope nobody researches where that came from because allegedly it didn't have any statistical underpinning or any particular logic, just three or four hours was a good standard time for turning people around. Really? I can't see a documented evidence journal paper that tells me this was based on pure science. And could three hour turnaround, four hour turnaround work in Hereford <coughs> as much as it works in Manchester? Mm, there's big differences. Okay, so this is the logic. This doesn't change much. This is the way that manufacturers look at things. The next thing, what doesn't work in healthcare? A lot of the quality tools don't work in healthcare. Some of them do. Most of Ishikawa's seven old tools do. Try doing an FMEA in the health service. And we have, with different teams that see each other every six weeks because they're on different rotors. We can get work out what is the severity of what we did we kill them, or we hurt them, or we stop them. The occurrence changes and the ability to detect changes with the team. So we get inconsistent results on some of the basic tools we need to move from level one and level two controls higher up the, higher up the, the hierarchy. So not all quality tools can be just simply imported. Five Ys works well. And this is the problem our research has. One of the big things we're interested in is sustainability of improvement in healthcare, and that ranges from everywhere, from Salem's work, he's in there somewhere, in Saudi Arabia, to Manisha's work in South Wales on patient safety. This is something we generally experience. Enthusiasm goes up. <laughs> we head on that first arrow into this cloud. This is what operators would see in a usual factory. I can do all the five whys you want. I can use all the seven tools that you want me to do, and I can solve all the problems. What hurts me is when I keep pointing to the maintenance team saying, I can't make my machines work any better because of poor maintenance and breakdowns. If the maintenance teams don't get involved, then I can't break through this ceiling. If the maintenance teams don't deploy knowledge to me as a team worker operating the machines, I will continue to point out problems with the factory, but because you lot are not solving my issues, I lose faith in you as a management team. Agreed? If I operate an MRI scanner, I need to know as much about that MRI scanner as possible in order to control it. But if I don't, I can only point out that it broke. What do we do with MRI scanners? Well, it comes out of a great book of IT which says turn it off and turn it on again after you've counted to 10, up to 10 and back from 10 to 1. Turn it on and hopefully the magnets will work again. Does this make sense? Put this to industry 4.0 then. You're going to have to know a lot about machines and a lot about product design and the skills of an Uber engineer to be able to get this to work. Surprise, surprise, the biggest investors in Industry 4.0 are the Germans. Unsurprising. Very clever advances. The Americans are also in there with the big money too. The Brits are lagging a little bit behind. But this is where we hit the problem. People get to, a, to the ceiling or the cloud where they can't do any further improvements because they've cleared up all the easy things to do. They don't know enough about the machinery or the system to make the next level of improvement. That's frightening because if this is the base of your pyramid in your organization, this is where most people are. And every time they get disenchanted with the middle and senior managers because you're not helping me to improve my system. Whew. In healthcare, we also have other role models. In the automotive industry, we had a role model called Toyota. You could go and see Toyota and understand Toyota. And even in the 1990s and late 1980s, Toyota would show you, but then try and get you to understand the problems and use your brains to figure out what the solutions were there for. I fell into that trap. First day in Toyota in the factory. Rich sand, why do you think we paint white crosses on forklift trucks? Ha <laughs> I'm not thick. It's because the white cross will show any dirt on those wheels as they go around the factory. And then on their backs they go, hugging their tummies and having the best laugh they've had for a long time. <laughs> Rich San, thank you very much. You've read too many books. We paint the white crosses on the wheels because if they go too fast, it stops being a turning white cross and turns into a white wheel and we book them for speeding. Good solution. I missed it. Trouble is, a lot of healthcare misses it. 
a lot of healthcare doesn't understand how much you buy or tax time or anything like that. So to impose a system from somebody else's way of working with Japanese words causes a lot of problem and wastes core knowledge. The biggest form of Murray is to stress out your people. What's the biggest cost and the biggest source of innovation in the NHS? Our people. Stressing them out isn't clever. So retrofitting them into this way of working without thinking through what it means is very difficult. There are no health exemplars at the moment. So this is why I'm trying to sell you. Four hours lead to four hours. So you've got reaction time in here. We're dealing with quicker and quicker turnaround processes. Discharge people as quickly as possible. Reliability engineering, which is how do we design systems that are robust? How do we put in systems that are resilient to shocks? Even Toyota's had to bounce back to buy a couple. The NASA report completely absolves Toyota of the carpet problem for the incorrectly ill-fitting carpets in the Corolla range in America and the recall was proven not to be a Toyota problem. It's a rogue dealer match that was put in. But Toyota fessed up, recalled, reissued, carried on. Everybody else was saying, cover up. Do what the automotive industry does, blame the supplier. If you don't think that happened several years earlier, Bridgestone was the butt of complaints of tires that blew, blew out in, on cars. So resilience is how do we cope and repeatability is your TWI, the biggest battleground at the moment for what we're doing. There must be a standard way because you teach the young ones how to do it. So there must be standards that can be put in place. If you get this right, we can live by the principles and the essence of respect for individuals, which we don't have at the moment. So there's a great case of uh, a lady who died in a hospital because nurses felt they couldn't stand up and talk to a senior anaesthetist because they didn't have the position power. That is not respect for the individual. The expert in the room was the nurse at the time who was trying to bag the patient and get some air inside her. So if you follow this other logic, we have a reason for building the system. This re word reason is a play on words as well. Jim Reason is a guy who you'll see in a minute develop something called the Swiss cheese model of, of patient safety. But it's something that we do in manufacturing, but we don't always recognize we do it. Then there's the result side, and then there's redundancy, and I don't mean job losses. I mean stand increased multi-skilling. Because having redundant skills is actually a great way of coping and moving people around. And you're going to need it in Industry 4.0 because you don't know where the demand's going. Agreed? So a different era, 25 years on, people said, what's different? Well, what's different is we now have to be much more sensitive within the same tack time of a failure. If you're producing a car every 52 seconds, you need to be able to detect a failure or deviation within 52 seconds and correct it. Because if you take 52 seconds, that's a car that's entered the rework pool. Agreed? Well, this is the pressure that's happening on our health service. So we have the same types of issues. So what I'm trying to sell you now is a variant of the lean approach. This is not to compete with Six Sigma or the other forms of extremists that go, you know, agile extremists or whoever they are that are basically using lean logic to compress time and improve flow. This is a safety view of how systems should be conducted based on how highly reliable organizations work without interruption or failure for long periods. So it's born out of the States, born out of applied work. And at Lurk, we've always been known for our applied work. And it's come, come from Carleen Roberts and Carl Veit. So these organizations work for long periods of time, just like Toyota, and they don't have failures. Why? Because they've understood the system logic and how to improve. So this is what they say is fake high reliability. So celebrating too often overly focused on the successes of the organization, lack of diversity in terms of our teams in healthcare, poor information or filtering of information so people can't use it, or ignoring that failure signs are happening. There were plenty of signs on Deepwater Horizon before it blew up and killed people. There were plenty of signs on Challenger before it blew up. There are plenty of signs on Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, any particular safety incident you want to have a look at. They were all, like, all indicators that the systems were failing. Even the tsunami that hit Fukushima had certain elements that could have been planned. Fukushima didn't have enough control systems that in the west would have been mounted higher and higher up in the air so that a tsunami could take out a nuclear power plant in the UK but not destroy the system. 
because the second control system kicks in, and if that gets wiped out by, tidal uh, by a surge wave of water, then the third one kicks in. So this is the modification, or the, the blood that sort of joins the lean family. A lot of the American experiments with this gentleman, Carl Vake, have been interesting, and they're worth applying into healthcare, because our primary motivation is to do no harm, safety and morale. And these five principles are quite interesting, and they put a different spin on how we use our people. The one is we have a preoccupation with failure. We're forever looking for, with situational awareness for slight indicators that the system's about to fail. We have a reluctance to simplify, which is why the FMEA doesn't work, or the five whys don't work if they're not used multiple times. Agree? There's usually more than one root cause as to why a failure happened. It's not just a case of doing the five whys once. But we don't do that in the, the health service. We go through the five whys and we think we found the, the solution. We try and fix it. Number three is a sensitivity to your operations and your design and all of your value stream maps that show us how we should process what we're doing. The fourth is a commitment to resilience through better training, visual management, all the other activities that allow us to recover quickly. And then we have the deference to expertise in the room, which alludes to a form of situational leadership that the person with the most knowledge in the room should lead the discussion of that particular team. Another learning from Lee. That the sensei doesn't always lead the learning, the sensei is there to help the teams to learn and find out for themselves. Agreed? So this is a carryover. This is a morph into uh, safety critical environments that takes the lean ideas. So this is anything to do with patient safety and the machine breakdowns, because we recognize those as accidents. So our argument and the research we're doing is very much into how do you cope? How can you cope with very fast reaction times without having systems that allow you to be resilient, repeatable, and work effectively, and to recover effectively because you know how your systems work? It's a different type of logic. So most of these experiments in Industry 4.0 don't have a great deal of business continuity planning related to them. What we do have is lots of IT that would tell us that the machine has broken down and that your order is probably going to be late and not make this latest shipment. So this is what the whole aerospace industry and the health system cling to. This is Jim Reason's safety model. In the lean world, we've also done a bad job of this in the main. Because we'll tell people safety is all about a pyramid of accidents, near misses, and bad behaviors. And that was built by somebody around the 1920s to look at insurance claims. It doesn't really fit healthcare. This is Jim Reason's idea. Each layer of that, sweet, uh, that cheese is almost like a department or a practice. If your arrow goes through a hole, it means they've gone through one of our defenses in our system. If all the holes line up, we hurt people or potentially kill people or have very bad outcomes. So this particular model for safety in healthcare is every time we have a problem, we invent another checklist. But I can guarantee that the next reason why a patient dies or has a fatality or, or something less worse is because the check wasn't on the check sheet. So this is the logic. The logic says put as many barriers as you can to stop that red arrow from going all the way through the system. Do you know the beauty of healthcare? In a lean system, we check our own work and we check the preceding operations. In a healthcare system, we don't do that. An error could have been created four or five steps down the process with a bad or incomplete referral. But we have to sort it out. So maximum rework in an area where the people can't tell the people earlier on in the process to change what they do. This isn't the same as being able to turn something off and say, sorry, this is defective. You're my internal supplier. I need a replenishment. The difference between me detecting it later on in the healthcare process and the event being happened could be six to nine months. We might not actually be able to trace the person who committed the lapse or error. Make sense? Getting tighter and tighter coupled, and we're getting less and less robust and reliable. And then we have Eric. I like Eric. <laughs> He's a nice guy. But he came up with the efficiency thoroughness trade-off. That in safety critical worlds, predominantly healthcare, you can have efficiency or thoroughness, but you can't have both. I don't agree, Eric. That wholly flies in the face of knowing best practice. So you're going to be thinking fast and thinking slow, are you, Eric? Nah. 
we can have well-designed systems in place that allow you to have efficiency and thoroughness. The best way of processing a patient in our system is thoroughness because that leads to efficiency. But everything's there. Do you know how many, hip, how many hip operations are canceled in a month because we don't have the surgical implements, but we knew the patient was coming? Mm -hmm. It's double digit percentages, and that's just hammers and saws. But don't worry, we now have a World Health Organization checklist that says, do we have an anesthetist? Present. Do we have some sores? Present. We're going to cure it all with a good checklist. Mm -hmm. We wait to be seen. But Eric is saying that you can have one or the other, but you can't have both. Excuse me, isn't that what the automotive industry told us in the 1980s? You can have quality, but it's going to cost a lot more. Or you can have rubbish quality, it would cost you a lot. So. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because I spent many a time, early career, in what is now an ASDA's in Longbridge. And they are quite resilient to change. You can have quality, or you can have it today, and we'll get it off the line for you. <laughs> They're all retired as well, love them. <laughs> right, checklist. This is heralded as the greatest thing for the health service. This is Athol Gilwandi's work. It's very good. He's a physician, so he should know what he's talking about. And he's been pumping the checklists. So these are checklists that allow us to go and do something and check whether we did it, or there's the read the checklist and go and do it. It is yet to be seen whether checklists do improve the safety of the system, which is why we're doing the research. What we do know is other people in safety critical environments use things like walk arounds. That's, that's an Airbus A330, and they check everything before they take off. And before they take off and fly out of Cardiff to Paris, they will practice landing on water. Do you think? Sully Sullenberger had to get out for a manual to find out how to land on the Hudson? No, every time he flies over water, they have to practice landing on water. When they hand over shifts or parts of the plane, I hand over to the first officer, and the first officer confirms I now have full control of the plane. <coughs> Decent handover. So there are some benefits in this. There's low-level tools to help improve but the systems are still very fragile. And this was a word that was used for lean, mainly by the people that didn't uh, understand lean in the 1980s and 1990s because they said it's a fragile system. No, it's not. It's very well designed. That's why it's stopless. So we have another issue. We want to be a culture in the top right. That is risk-taking experiments, and we do lean, but we actually have cultures that are in the bottom left. Internally focused, it's about my profession. We have a lot of egos, a lot of people that want to refer to bureaucracy, even though we know bureaucracy may not be right. So some of the research is now testing people's appetites. And we have a lot of people, a lot of evidence to show rogue clinicians that seek to change systems. Cardiologists from Newport and A&E consultants from Birmingham that are all there changing their system and heading towards the peopleless A&E department. Yeah, but what we do is we have a fundamental conflict in culture. We want people to have a just culture and report errors, but we don't want er any errors to happen. So let's look at the defenses in the healthcare or safety critical environment. This is just to spin it back into going back to talking about resilience. We can do workplace organization. We can do physical improvement of the workplace. We can visualize our pathway. They're precursors. They are good defenses, but they're not enough. The ones that come next are roles and responsibilities for clear handovers of care and delivery of care. This is what's changing in some of our systems now. We are changing and we're moving paramedics to community settings because paramedic work in the UK is about 4% blue flashing lights and 96% other activities. We are not a taxi service and many of the ambulance services are, are paid on conveyance in the same way Old fire services used to be paid for putting out fires, but we don't put out fires anymore, we prevent them. So the models are changing. So these models also have to be mobile. So the things we've played with is we've moved paramedics to the community settings and put them in with GPs so they can respond quicker to patients such as those with COPD or other forms of respiratory problem that can be handled outside of a hospital. What does it do for the hospital? It frees up time to use our 
very talented people with very specialist knowledge to service people that need more effective care. They're more complicated. So these are the barriers. Visualize the system, get the workplace better so there's a standard workplace because no two a &E departments in the UK are the same. Establish clear roles and responsibilities. Look at handovers. So you've got a cleanliness of movement of the patient. With a dirty handover, you risk uh, safety breaches. Increase situational awareness so we know what's going on. The health service didn't like this in the past because they said, you can't have a visual pictorial of what's happening to every patient on our ward. That's against patient confidentiality. Well, it is if you put it in the middle of the ward. If you put it in the team room and use it for your multidisciplinary handover, it's probably quite an effective tool. Then we have multidisciplinary teaming and then team working for greater levels of improvement and heading out to see exemplars in other areas. So, for example, Tony, your area of, of working with teams in, in blood processing. Because this is what people are looking to you to design. The trouble with doing lots of value stream maps or swim lane maps or process activity maps or the old trick of turning up with a bit of brown paper and some post-its isn't quite as rigorous as what you need in the new era. Lean gives you the logic, the essential logic. This probably overlays the reliability that you're going to need. So hence, back to the, the things I'm trying to sell you. Four R's. When you're actually reducing your reaction time, your cycle times, you will need reliability engineering concepts to be able to design your production systems, which are there for cash flow or patient flow in our, our, our condition. Then we need systems that are resilient to shocks, which includes preparing for emergency situations. Most of the emergency situations we face in healthcare are as predictable as landing on water. And then repeatability through TWI, which has been the most of the resilience has come from any form of standardizing of good practice which is bizarre, really, when you consider we're there to care. We're looking at reliability and process optimization, reliability engineering, people like Manish, Pauline, we're looking at airport 4.0, baggage handling systems. What's the interest there? The interest there is you can disgrace an airport and a carrier if your bags don't go with you on the plane. The bags are incredibly complicated. They churn around a system as big as Heathrow, at the speed of a Formula One car. So these systems have to work on demand. We don't fly 24 hours a day. So all systems have to work exactly when they're needed. What are we interested in? Higher forms of data management, higher forms of reliability center maintenance, and building layers of, of protection for people that are catching planes that don't even know we exist. All the way through to nuclear. And what happens we're learning from nuclear. Why are we interested in nuclear? Because you can't operate a train or a nuclear facility in the UK unless you have a safety case. Because it's an important sector. You can operate an entire hospital or healthcare group without a single ca safety case. Don't you think that's frightening? Mmm. Very frightening. Very frightening. In actual fact, it's so frightening that most people that are inadvertently hurt by the healthcare service, don't even get their time on the six o'clock news because it's not that much of good newsworthy stuff. That's frightening. And then we're looking at other forms of patient flows, what happens, and these are some of the projects. These are some of the Bevan projects that sit alongside us. This is an investment of the Welsh Government in about 40 improvement people every year that come in. And similar to sort of Stefan's work in the past, they will be given an introduction to understanding systems and how they work and what they can do to improve their particular part of the process. Everything from paramedics to palliative care pathways to heart replacement valves, etc., etc. So we're looking at the four R's across an awful lot of organizations. The one here that's probably of most interest to you is the organic farmers in America because we have a very interesting workforce. They're called Mexicans, they're either new Mexicans, first or second generation Mexicans. They often can speak English very well. They're often very, very analytical and very good, but we've never found a way of getting them integrated with our production systems. So we've given them iPads, we show them how the system works, we've gamified the production system, and now they own their production processes. They're also very aware of what errors happen in their systems and how they produce a robust system for the sake of an iPad and a little graph that shows you what you're doing. It's a hell of a good experiment. That's 200 farmers. Everything from almond milk to freeze-dried product. 
So all of this is how do we build robust systems. So in summary, I think 25 years on, and it never started in health, so it's bad for me to criticize, but I think we're quite good at tasks. We're not very good at processes. We certainly don't know what happens the stage after the stage I'm dealing with. We are wholly ignorant of pathways, and often blissfully so. Uh, pathway being an end-to-end -end journey of the patient, so from referral to re uh, return back home. We have no idea of all of the problems we create for other people in the system. So we're good at the tasks, so we have the basic level. We're probably not so good at some of the environmental and workload level. We are terrible at TWI forms of standard work, often because we have different shifts that change every six weeks. And if I'm in theatre, my anaesthetist will be one person this week, and then I might not see them for another five weeks until we come on motor again. There are lots of issues with the way in which we standardise, which is why the pilots to prove are there for embedding lean in a standard way. So, to be honest, we have a lot to learn, and the benefit of healthcare with the highly reliable organisation approach is it means we can re-question all of the works of lean and the essence of how we put this into a hospital. We don't have the luxury of importing lots of ideas. We have to go back to basics and work out what we're going to do with our patients to make our systems work. And that's it. Yeah, we have lots of different experiments, including observing what can only be described as departments of progress chasers that sit there on screens like a bet Fred or a, a one-armed bandit waiting for pa certain patients in certain cubicles to go red and get close to a three to four hour turnaround and then they're ringing up the any &E department to move them on. We also see the dysfunctions of that form of data manipulation in terms of A&E people aren't stupid. They will transfer them to a medical assessment unit uh, to move them into a, a means of holding. So they'll put them into a buffer where we do a lot more tests on them, but they're not technically in the A&E department. So some of it causes dysfunctions. Mid-Staffordshire, for example, if you track the story of Mid-Staffordshire, she's performed as an organisation much better than most organisations, and you can only come to the conclusion that they were recoding their data and they were manipulating data within the system to look good because it was all part of a league table. That does, it does allude to that in the, the Francis report. But in terms of big data, no, it would be lovely to, to really find out what happens. One of our biggest issues is we know that on the antenatal journey, a low-risk lady will go through our process very, very quickly, very, very, very um, planable. And that particular service user or patient wants a very knowledgeable process, what's going to happen to me at each stage. And they like to come in. They don't like to sit in car parks waiting to come in to see people. They want to come in scan, picture, gone. So the data we'd be most interested in would be the ladies, for example, that are HIV positive, possibly come from a sub-Saharan African country, have mental issues that are a result of rioting and civil war. Those, that's the data we'd like to understand because we, I think we will get our mind around the, the relatively predictable patient, but the multiple patient that uses multiple shared resources and often twice or more is the data we'd really like to get into. How do we design a care pathway that can be put together very quickly for somebody who's in a, an advanced state of, of trauma or psychological distress? That would be really cool. But no, we, are, we, are, we haven't got data analysts yet. I'm, I'm going to rattle a can now. If anybody would like to give us money, please send your checks to the following address. <laughs> I'm joking. But if any IT companies are out there that would like to do something, I'm sure we can. We do have lots of data. Manish's work, for example, looking at the southwest. Yeah. Manish can captures patient stories where they go on social media unprompted and they write back to the ward that's just had them. So the feedback on their problem have to prove that they've actioned your response. Thank you very much for telling us the food variety was not good or there was no halal moot or I wasn't treated with dignity. We'll feed that back, and at the next huddle, they get to grips with sorting it out. And then they write back to the patient to close the loop, to say this is what we've done as a result, and photographs of what's done. And that goes to the exec level as well. The execs can see all of the patient narratives coming back.
with the most knowledge, not necessarily the one with the greatest hierarchy. So we try and teach nurses to say the words, I'm uncomfortable with this. We have previously taught the clinicians to say, if you hear the words, I'm uncomfortable with this, he or she as a nurse is telling you you're contravening what is a good practice or you're not quite reading the situation properly. So this isn't about top down, um, you know, you tug your forelock to me because I went to university and I have all of these, you know, I got the Bentley outside and private practice. No, no, no. That, that any nurse or any porter or anybody can use the words, I'm uncomfortable with this, and it shuts the process dead. It's a trigger system right, to say this could go badly wrong. And in most of the cases, like um, with um, in the southeast of England, the nurses actually asked for that after two critical incidents where senior anaesthetists, unfortunately, combined. So they both got trapped into, I need to put a tube in this lady's neck. The nurses were saying, you need to put a bag on her because she hasn't got enough air. And the, the anaesthetists are going, she's at 40% and falling, and you keep trying to put the tube in. No, her airway can't cope with the tube. So the nurses are there saying, I'm uncomfortable with this, I'm uncomfortable with this, and we use that type of real life setting. Bear in mind, the anaesthetists have 19 years service and 26 years service each. We now teach people to say, I'm uncomfortable with this, we, we need to, anything that's uncomfortable, we stop instantly because it means somebody doesn't understand or something's gonna go badly wrong. And we can't rework people very easily. Yeah, to some extent, or also the nudge. So all this behavioral insight stuff from central government, the nudge, <laughs> which was explained to me by the, the great example of men and urinals. And the Dutch put a little blue fly in your urinal because apparently it attracts our attention to we on the blue fly, not we on the floor. That's a behavioral nudge, apparently. We're trying to nudge people about you know, antimicrobial resistance. You don't want to have another antibiotic because the superbug's coming. It's that 1% of all things that Domestos doesn't kill. It's just lapping it up. No, it's a joke. It's the one bug that will wipe out entire populations if it becomes resistant. And the old days was you'd go in and your son or daughter would have a jippy tummy and you'd go, you might be the GP, you haven't got enough time to see me, I want antibiotics. Well, all the antibiotics are going to do is flush the belly out of your child. It means their loose tummy becomes a little bit looser and it all comes out. And then 48 hours later, you're, you should be right as rain. So there's a lot of nudging going on to say, if you come to the GP and consume this time with the GP, you will risk not being immune to a microbial in the future. And other things like your dentist. I love my doctor. My doctor sends me a text. It's not because she loves me. It's because she knows that most of us don't turn up. So as a small trader GP, 10% of my patients don't turn up. What am I going to do? I have to accommodate them somehow when they do want to turn up. And most people's perceptions of GPs is completely wrong, by the way. They think they do a bit of surgery in the morning. They don't look up. They're quite annoyed people. Then as soon as surgery's finished, they all jump in their cars and go and play golf or fish for a bit. And then they come back for afternoon clinic. No, they go in their cars and they go and see people. So we have quite a big issue with do not attend, people doing the wrong thing, people coming in and asking for antidepressants. I know Zopoclone is what I want, it'll help me sleep. No, that's an opioid, it's highly addictive. This is the outcome of an opioid and, and driving, and you drive for a living. So there's, there's lots of stuff that we can do to, to help clinicians reprogram patients. And a lot of it is from behavioral insights. People being told the cost of my missed surgery is like 140 pounds to this particular clinician. It's not recoverable. Or the cost of your wasted medicines. We've got a project like that in South Wales out-of-date nutritional supplement. <sighs> Look, you can pass its sell-by date, you throw it away. Oh, no, why did it go through, why did it get off of its sell-by date? Oh, because we don't do stock rotation very well. Because we don't understand stocks. We don't understand that without that dietary supplement there, we can't process the patient safely. And you think, how much have we got? Let's have an amnesty, and you find it coming back in cartloads. Out-of-date medicines. Oh. They're all prescribed, the pharmacist got paid, every got paid, the pharmaceutical company got paid, and we bin them. The repeat prescription is brilliant, because everybody ticks everything. What shall I have? <gasps> I want my blue inhaler and my brown inhaler. Why? Because I've got a box that I can tick. 
really? You're that asthmatic? You need to keep having these pumps even though it's sporadic? I can't talk out of turn on individual clinical diagnoses and everything else, but there's a lot of this that goes on. I will tick everything because I'm entitled to it. And don't just think it's patients. Intermediate care homes do the same. It's bizarre. But we are a good health service at the end of the day. There are very few people that turn up and willfully do a bad job. There was only one person in my lifetime I ever knew did that, and that's a gentleman called Harold Shipman, who was mentally disturbed and, and addicted to opiates. But of the millions of people that work in health service, everybody turns up to do a good, good job and do a good shift. So there's plenty to go at and lots of robustness that we can put into what are, in effect, lean systems. Thank you.